Yes. So Steve, go ahead. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Okay, and you can see my screen. Yes. Fantastic. All right, thanks. Um, so I'm Steve Goldman. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Today, I'm going to be talking about extragalactic evolved stars. This is the diagnostics in nearby and distant galaxies session. So Ambra focused more on some of our recent constraints, and I'm going to be talking more about our recent observations and the state of our observations. So I'll, this is a, a brief overview. I'm just going to be talking about how we identify evolved stars, um, how we probe their underlying characteristics, what other people are doing, um, probing galaxies with evolved stars, and then what the next couple of years look like um, for our observations. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the last decade, but if you're looking for more previous works, there's some excellent reviews by Martin Grunewagen and Martha Boyer. So before I get into extragalactic stars, you're probably wondering, hey, Steve, why do I need to leave the galaxy? I'm doing great science in the galaxy. I'm pretty happy. Uh, great question, audience. Um, if you want to get a better understanding of the total life cycle of evolved stars, you need to see the whole life cycle. And for some of the most obscured stars in our galaxy, they're hidden behind the galaxy's disk. So if you want to look at the full life cycle of stars, you need all of them. Second, uh, if you want to probe the full parameter space that we expect in the universe, you can't really do that in the galaxy, especially for regions that are extremely metal poor that are representative of, say, high redshift galaxies. And then lastly, for other nearby galaxies, we have common distances to things like distance, um, metallicity. So for a lot of our nearby galactic sources, we have distances from Gaia, but uh, for a little bit farther out, we don't. And so for nearby galaxies, we can assume a distance. So this is our general strategy for how we, we tackle our observations. We get a simple observation. We do use a couple of different methods and techniques to get sample properties. And then we used more advanced modeling to get the underlying physics. And this is something I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. So where can we look? There's of course the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, they've been the most studied. They're, they host the most complete populations of evolved stars. So this is done a large part with instruments like Spitzer, surveys like SAGE and OGLE. So we have a lot of the pulsation properties as well. We also have more massive galaxies like Andromeda M31 or Triangulum M33. So these are more representative of our own galaxy. They host a larger stellar population, but they're more distant. And so we don't have the sensitivity and completeness when we're studying them. And then also nearby dwarf galaxies. These are important laboratories for studying uh, high redshift AGB analogs. And so they're, they're also extremely useful and there's been a lot of recent work done in them. So now identifying evolved stars, how do we do it? This might be a review for some of, some of us. Uh, here's some recent studies of um, groups that have just been trying to identify evolved stars using infrared photometry. Uh, this, this is not complete, but um, the, the recent works. How do people tend to do this? A uh, typical method is using the J minus K color. So this is uh, using the near infrared colors to probe these important molecular features. And so these groups tend to fall in these colored regions that I'm showing here on this color magnitude diagram or CMD. I'm also showing the extreme or X AGB stars. This is in a different phase of evolution, but it's important to isolate these stars if you wanna understand the full dust contribution. So these are stars that we expect are in the superwind phase, but they tend to fall to the right of this color magnitude diagram. Here I'm showing some of the typical cuts that we use for identifying red supergiants um, from Yang et al. 2019 for isolating the AGB stars. Uh, this is showing the, the same cuts as I was showing before, but overlaid with some of the spectroscopically confirmed stellar types. And so as you can see, um, there is some cross-contamination. This method is particularly 
not that good at identifying uh, the dustiest carbon stars because you also get dusty oxygen stars as they fall to the right of the CMD. And then you also get some contamination from other stellar types, younger stars. So while this method is efficient in identifying the general groups of evolved stars, it's not foolproof and you do get some cross-contamination. Uh, this is possibly even worse in the mid-infrared where you get more cross-contamination from different stellar types of evolved stars and much more contamination from younger stellar objects or H2 regions, but it is again, efficient. You can also um, determine additional characteristics and chemical types of AGB stars using additional filters. And one of the combinations of filters that we like to use are these three on Hubble. So the general strategy is to find a filter that probes a molecular feature, uh, molecular feature in carbon, but that's relatively clean in oxygen-rich AGB stars. And then plotting them on a color-color diagram. And so here, the, the green filters on the left here, the green filter and the pink filter, in the green filter, it's deep in the CN plus feature in the carbon stars, and it's relatively free of molecular features in the and then in the, the pink filter, you have that deep water absorption in the oxygen star, relatively clean in the carbon star. We also do this for a, another filter combination. Um, these two filters here, similar idea. You plot them on a color color diagram on the y axis there. And this is what you get a beautiful separation of the oxygen rich AGB stars in the blue region and then the carbon stars in the red region. Uh, this has the additional effect of. Uh, deeper water absorption is represented by stars up into the left of this diagram. So, um, you can see in the water feature on the left, the deeper it is, the farther up it goes in the color diagram. Also, all the foreground stars fall in the white region of the color color diagram. And then the dustier the star is, it moves up into the right, following those two extinction vectors, the arrows there. And with the angular resolution of Hubble, you can resolve a background galaxies. So this is a really powerful method for identifying different stellar types quite accurately. Another method that's used to identify chemical types is using narrowband CN and TIO filters. And this is using a similar strategy, similar idea where it has some degree of spectral typing due to the depth of these features, as you can see on this uh, color color diagram on the right. And when you plot the data, this is um, what you get. So these are two methods of, of identifying more of the characteristics of evolved stars. If you really want to know about the chemistry, you got to do spectroscopy. It's a little more costly in terms of the uh, telescope time that you need to use, but you get a lot more information about the dust and a lot of the constraints that we've learned um, uh, Ambra was just talking about. So here's a couple of exam examples of recent extragalactic uh, spectroscopic studies. And of course, you can't talk about extragalactic evolved stars without talking about variability. There's been a lot of work done in recent years, especially in um, nearby dwarf galaxies, uh, but also the Magellanic Clouds, M31, M32, and M33. And then on the right here is uh, data from, I think, the LMC showing the different modes and overtones that we're observing. We're learning a lot about the pulsation uh, effects of metallicity as well. So going back to my, my strategy that I was showing before with a couple more details. So we start off with observations, infrared fluxes, magnitudes, and colors. We might have observations in submillimeter like CL lines or maser lines in the radio. We can construct spectral energy distributions and uh, we have light curve information. So we use our different methods and tools, light curve analysis, spectral energy distribution fitting. We can fit the CL lines and we can get more of the sample properties. And then from that, we need even more models to get at the underlying characteristics, um, their dredge of efficiency, the effects of metallicity. And also we need properties of the galaxy as well. And again, this is, these are all kind of groupings of works that have made a lot of progress in these different subcategories, but this is kind of stuff that Ambra was talking about. So I'll just leave this here for reference. I also wanted to talk about um, how other people are probing uh, galaxies with evolved stars, because I think there's a lot of potential in the data that they're getting. And one of the, the big things is they've been using it as distance probes, using both the tip of the red giant branch 
technique, but also the Myra period luminosity relation, which is what I'm showing here on the right. This is um, from Wenlong Yuan's recent paper showing the oxygen rich and carbon rich populations fit with a quadratic. And they use this to get fairly accurate distance to M33. Uh, other than the Myra period luminosity relation, there's also, I saw um, someone using a carbon star luminosity function as a distance probe. And then also, on top of that, you can learn a lot of information about uh, the star formation history and galaxy evolution and scenario by looking at the spatial distribution of the evolved stars compared to other stellar populations. So I think there's a lot of potential at, at working with these groups. And then I also wanted to talk about upcoming observations. I think there's still a lot of potential with Hubble. It's still taking great data. Uh, there's a lot of potential with the FAT data. And also, also there's um, the Lovett survey coming up, which is using those three Hubble medium band filters in a bunch of nearby dwarf galaxies. And this is led by Martha Boyer and observations are ongoing. But we also have a really exciting year coming up. Uh, next year, hopefully we'll have all these instruments. Here I'm showing a simulated color magnitude diagram of the James Webb data that we're expecting and the depth and distance we'll be able to go. So we'll be able to resolve thermally pulsing AGB stars out to say five megaparsecs. So that opens a lot of doors in the environments that we can probe. Uh, with Rubin, of course, we'll have a lot of information on the pulsation properties of evolved stars in the next couple of years. And then also with Euclid, uh, we'll have um, a lot of TPAGB candidates that are detected. So it's something, from what I understand, something similar to two mass, but much deeper. And then a little bit farther down the road, we'll have, of course, Roman, uh, which is similar to Hubble, but with much more serving capacity. Here I'm showing the footprint of Hubble compared to the footprint of Roman. Um, so that'll help us a lot in terms of identifying thermally pulsing AGB candidates. And then even farther down the road, of course, we'll have the SKA, um, its Pathfinder surveys, which will be great for Mesa work. We'll have the WAR and origins for a lot of studies in the dust and the dust properties, and then a bunch of other planned emissions. So exciting times. Um, coming back to this, I think in the next couple of years, we're gonna have a big jump in data in this second step. And so it is critically important that we develop our methods and tools and our models so that we can use this data to the fullest. Um, and it's important that we do this now because we wanna be able to take in our new data, have the methods and tools to interpret it, the data and then reapply for data because some of these missions are quite short. So James Webb's planned mission time is only a couple of years, five years. And so it's really important that we work on this um, now. And then I wanted to finish with uh, this here. Of all the papers that I've, I've shown, this is essentially what we tend to publish in these groups. Um, this is made with ADS. And so if you see your name on this uh, figure here, um, I want you to look at the other groups and uh, make sure you know what they're working on. This is a small enough uh, sub-discipline that we should all know what we're working on. I think there's a lot of benefit. Um, there, of course, is some overlap. Um, so we're pretty good at that, I'm proud of that. But make sure you know what the other groups are working on. And then I wanted to also leave up a couple um, ideas for discussion um, and where I think we have a lot of potential. So thank you all for listening.